and we can get going. Hi everybody, welcome to this um, special lecture. Um, it's lovely to have you join us this afternoon. Um, my name is Professor Becky Early. I'm here to introduce uh, Kay Politovich's talk this afternoon. Um, I just want to start by saying a couple of quick words. Um, I've had the great pleasure of working with Kay for many, many years, and she was uh, my boss and my mentor and uh, my research colleague and collaborator. Um, and there's no end to the things that I've learned from her. So when we had the opportunity to come up with an event for the graduate showcase this year, um, it was just a fantastic opportunity to ask Kay to reflect on some of, of the things that she's um, learned over the years and the many, many, many things she's learned over the years and to put together a presentation which is really addressing um, the future that faces so many of you and and in an exciting and inspiring way Kay I think is always uh, for me very inspiring um, and I've always really valued the way in which she sees the world and the way in which she sees textiles and textile designers and what they might do um, so I really hope you enjoy this uh, presentation I'm actually going to we've both been jabbed and we've both tested and I'm now going to very carefully hand the computer to her who she sat right by me here <laughs> so you can see her and now hopefully hear her too thank you becky that's great well that's a nice introduction um i do hope i can inspire i'll get on inspiring now i think um okay so i'm i'm planning to talk today about the textile designer um what i'm not sure about is how exactly that relates to individuals um, and the particular characteristic of each and every one of us that are called textile designers. Um, I'm aware that designer is an impossible concept because designers are all individuals, not one person. So already I'm trying to talk for you and for me, but I believe uncertainty is a valid design position. So here we go. I'd like to direct my talk today towards things that interest me, and I hope you too, and ideas about increasing environmental sustainability through textile design, as I believe it's the most important thing facing all our futures. That's not to say the most important factor in making work is not the pure excitement, curiosity and fascination with material processes, and random responses to life in general, it is. But you need to see that in the bigger context of what part it plays in the world today. So here's my plan for the talk. And the image is from brave modernist architects and engineers of the 1960s who built lifts like this in many new buildings. Now, amusingly, it looks impossibly old technology from about the 18th century. Um, and it's pretty much universally decommissioned for health and safety reasons, as you can imagine. But as a constantly moving, slowish conveyor belt for people in tall buildings, the button you see in the center was to stop the lift, not to call it. So the never ending chain of loop of open compartments, which were on the move, slow and wobbly, but enabled a jump on and off at will, 
eventually without much hesitation, eventually. <laughs> Starting and ending your journey singly or in groups, it made getting to know one another very enjoyable. And I chose this image as a reference to my beginnings way back and as a metaphor for an aspect of my talk today, loops of circularity and continuous flow. Now, as you may have guessed from the caption on the lift, my BA course was in Leicester Polytechnic, which became De Montfort University. And I was very attracted to the then new offer of many art school disciplines in one place in higher education, a very exciting prospect. And every subject area had new specialist equipment and regular visiting freelance practitioners on the teaching teams, encouraging individual freedom to create. And already there was a sense that the big traditional textile production and the kind of design associated with it was migrating geographically, leaving the UK for places with cheaper production costs. But that was also a kind of design release. It encouraged textile designers to be freed from convention and to experiment with studio production. And weirdly, I think the world we graduates were going out to had many parallels with today's very conflicted and troubled scene politically, socially, financially. It was very tough to survive then too. But I believe now, unlike then, the opportunities for designers to find a role for creative contribution, to be visible through technology and to gain acceptance for innovation from leaps of imagination have got credibility now in the world of finance and industry. The transition from product to system and service only increases the opportunities for textile designers taking on design challenges and working with multiple users, waste streams and virtual worlds and so on. So here is a sketch of what I'm going to talk about and the introduction being the beginning of that. I'll move on to the next thing. And the next thing for me is what I'd like to say is the scope and depth and variety of the work on exhibition from Chelsea Textile students this year is more enlightened and relevant to today's world than anything I've seen to date. Um, and the MA is still to come, of course. So congratulations to students and staff who are practitioners themselves as well for the challenging year behind you and the exciting years ahead for graduates and students coming along to benefit from these ideas and methods. Um, they and you will absorb them into your future practice, I know. And I find many of the same ideas current in the work of other design subjects across UAL, common ground, reason to be confident of designers having empathy with the human condition and wanting to affect production. So there are pressing world issues, environmental and social. But I was reading yesterday that the record for most patents ever recorded was in the USA in the 1930s, in the middle of a deep recession. So inventiveness comes from necessity, not abundance. And in his work, Anti-Fragile, Nassim Taleb says that frequent mild recessions are good for an economy as it fuels creative innovation, just as mild ingestions of bacteria are good for a constitution. So, I think that we can all imagine that this is a good year and a good decade to be emerging as a new designer into the world of um, textiles and the future of production. So one key issue is that whole life cycle thinking or circularity can conceive of the most important issues in designing materials. And I want to talk about that um, in approaches to textiles. And I am aware that circularity is a very general term without the nuance of realities every day. It often doesn't distinguish, for example, between the lifetime of materials and that of products, which are often very different. So firstly, creative thinking often means we work on what feels like a good idea and then rationalize it later. Nothing wrong with that. We have to try it out in a build and they will come mentality. And we may, we may need nothing more as a stimulus than a purely physical response to materials or processes or a search for beauty. There are many more good ideas that we can post rationalize 
than pre-rationalise. That doesn't make creative, th creative thinkers irrational, as is sometimes suggested, since imaginative leaps are hard to justify in science or a measure-reliant discipline such as engineering or economics. Only a few very respected experienced scientists can work on a hunch, a code word for a lot of inherent knowledge. As the scientific method requires the approved and safe process, which is almost always to build on build the next move on what's already known. And the same in business. Few financial investors will back ideas without data. Secondly, designers are also problem solving in their thinking. The first problem to solve is how to make an idea concrete. A grappling with technique is needed for real and virtual expression. And textile designers particularly have a design process suited to collaboration. We make 2D or 3D models, even to understand what we're thinking about. So the workshop, real or virtual, is part of our traditional studio. And making is the way we realize even our own thinking. Enjoy it, critique it, share it, see how it inspires or translates for a specific context. And key to this is the design prototype or sample. Discussion with other disciplines then has a focus. Nigel Cross in Designerly Ways of Knowing said, as a way of working and thinking, design sits between science, which observes the facts of the material world, and the humanities, which interprets the complexities of human experience. Design takes a middle path and is primarily concerned with that fragile quality, which is achieved when the best of human intentions are realized within the constraints of reality. Design blends the concerns of science and the humanities to search for outcomes that are balanced and opportunistic, grounded in the real world, but driven by human aspirations. So textile design is often speculative. I want to emphasize not all intentions are formulated as problems to be solved at the outset. For instance, images here are from the studio of designer Hella Jongarius. And her practice is a continuous exploration of material forms. Here, exploring ways to weave 3D architectural structures, often ranging over several disciplines, not always with a final outcome in mind, like a provisional solution in search of a problem. The completed pieces are inspiring when they're developed on for architectural innovation. And it's a playful and oblique way of exploring structures using a range of materials and scales to test their transferability in different contexts. She makes 3D forms with woven plastic structures and plaited solar strips and so on. You can be a designer and be interested in more than just the new. Hella says she's interested in what could be and in all our work ends with provisional outcomes and an unknown future. And creative thinking is not exclusive to art and design, but it is our major contribution to general discourse. Creative methods are characterized by leaps of imagination. And here you see two examples of creative solutions to problems identified by designers at Halle Berg University, for whom I set a project asking students to design an object, a system or a service to last a short time, but be sustainable. And since life cycle thinking is a very general and theoretical term, it doesn't deal with everyday realities. For exa example, it doesn't always distinguish between the materials and products, as I say, which are often very different. So we can create products to last a long time and those in which materials are long lasting, but the products temporary. So here to illustrate a couple of outcomes on the left, the billboards advertising upcoming events usually are on paper, but here they were coated with a light sensitive pigment and the projected images were able to fade and disappear after a few days. And the hammer on the right is a solution to having tools when you need them at home, using a vacuum and everyday household objects, the basis for construction. So store cupboard food and the tools could be cooked and eaten afterwards. So design can be purposeful, but playful. In the urgency of circularity of materials and material flow, the point can be well made with humor. 
The impact is on materials choice to produce a piece of work and what's involved in its onward journey in terms of the care and disposal. From the beginning of our research group at Chelsea, we were also conscious that we were the architects of the onward journey because of our design decisions. And this image is of the first collaboration of our textile research group at Chelsea, the first big one at least. And it's also a collaboration with other disciplines for dyeing, laser cutting and transforming a big interior space in Italy. And the collaboration across design and science created an atmosphere which gave all us participants the freedom to explore ideas through discussion and shared exploration. So the outcome was more innovative than conventional inquiry. And designers have a method of pushing a proposed concept till it breaks as a way of establishing strengths and weaknesses in a model. A new and more durable proposal can be built then, which can be subtle and eccentric, reflecting disciplines. What is key then is the rigorous analysis of the performance from the scientific method to ensure it's a credible solution, not always adopted in, in art contexts. A does, design idea usually needs to be realized by collaboration with other disciplines. And here we worked with a physicist to make science, scientific images accessible to a lay audience. The experimental installation communicated the beauty of scatter patterns from scientific research in X-ray crystallography. Diffracted rays of light are collected on a photographic plate and produce a model of a structure. And the scatter patterns were used as imagery for printed laser cut environments. But also, and importantly, our prototype samples enabled us to trial theoretical ideas for sustainability that we were interested in. Laser cut images with light projection, non-invasive magnetic structures for temporary fabric suspension, and ready-mades as decorative elements trying natural indigo on cheap industrial fabric. Everything from the installation was intact and stored for reuse after disassembly. So cross-discipline collaborations, of course, are not all collaborations with scientists and technologies. Many designers are interested in garments and fashion outcomes. Designer Maria Bless has worked in collaboration with the dancer Kenzo Kusuda, and this has opened up new ways that she can think about her practice and has a strong link to the interconnection between movement and costume. Also a connection to the transition from product to service and systems thinking. Bless says, my work is based on a continual investigation into the possibilities of a material. And this pro process produces many possible applications. Essential factors are simplicity, clarity, beauty, sustainability, and an optimal use of the material and its qualities. Ultimately, to incite the flow of continuous creation, no waste, no loss of energy, and alive. So what's going on in our heads when we work and when we think creatively? I'm fascinated by the investigations in behavioral sciences. Work by Daniel Kahneman and others in behavioral economics offers very compelling arguments about brain function in relation to conscious and unconscious decision-making. Kahneman and Fersky use the theory that the brain has a fast and slow function. The hypothesis is explained in the book, Thinking Fast and Slow. The main thesis is that the brain is split between two modes of thinking, system one, the fast instinctive emotional system, and system two, slower, more deliberating and logical. And the book delineates rational and non-rational motivations or triggers associated with each type of thinking process and how they complement each other. Kahneman maintains they've established through experiment and observation that people always make decisions intuitively using the fast brain and then justify the decision with logic, the slow brain and both are necessary for us to function. Design thinker Anne Thorpe says, designers have a particular range of skills that makes them capable of working with fast or slow knowledge, possibly serving as a bridge between the two. And 
neurologist Roger Sperry's 1960 theory is that people are either left-brained or right-brained, meaning that one side of their brain is dominant. This is based on the fact that the brain's two hemispheres function differently, called the dominant preference, and it's a theory for the identification of personality types. And if you tend to be more creative or artistic, you're thought to be right-brained, system one, fast. And if you're mostly analytical and methodological in your thinking, you're said to be left-brained, system two, slow. It's interesting to apply that to the process of designing textiles, especially the artifacts we make as an outcome. It could be good to persuade others of behavior change, to actually want a more sustainable lifestyle. We're reframing the problem. Also, that striving for beautiful color, joyful pattern, elegant simplicity, all appeal to the right brain activity, and that's the decision maker. So something like, if people believe in the conclusions, then they find the arguments convincing, would translate into textile design hands as, if you were knocked out by the sheer desirability of the product, then you buy into the brand's ethos and narrative. So to get behavior change, as advertisers well know, you must appeal to system one, fast, instinctive, and emotional. Since your beliefs come from childhood, psychologists tell us, logic doesn't change your beliefs. System one needs to be convinced, then system two articulates the logic and adopts the narrative. So behavioral sciences, scientists observe that people are committed to doing A, what is familiar, and B, what other people are doing. So instead of using persuasion via logic and statistics to change mindsets, make it much easier and attractive for people to change their behavior. Make it easier to evaluate information. Make more transparent the system you hope they will adopt. Generally, improve the environment to ease decision making. So as a designer who wants to have influence, You've got to hack the unconscious, to paraphrase Rory Sutherland, who is vice CEO of Ogilvy Advertising. A, design the sustainable textile product and make sure it's what people want. Or B, give people what they want and make sure it's sustainable. Cameron Tonkinwise pointed out that the job of design is not connected to the creation of artifacts whether communication, product or environment, but the practice of design is actually about persuading a, a huge range of actors, fellow designers, suppliers, investors, logistics managers, and so on, to work together on materializing a future in which such an artifact exists. So all the empathy of textile designers, all the love of material qualities, the inventiveness, the hunger to touch, and shape things, all the love of collecting, the love of nature and culture, the humor and ingenuity, the love of repetition, of surprise, of symmetry, asymmetry, incongruity, simplicity, complexity, and difference. Since design can only inspire change rather than demand it, shouldn't all that go into producing work which creates value over time? So, the bad news is poverty and waste are common features of an increasingly complex global economy and they impact heavily on people and the environment. We need creative solutions because access to material resources is essential to the needs of an increasing population in the world and to the future of production. So implications for the future are diminishing supplies coupled with added demand. Creative engagements must address the problem with objective clarity and establish flexibility to withstand change. Any kind of circularity model for materials or economics has to put people's well-being for everyone at its core, including access to the goods and services for the least advantaged of us. And theories about closed loops of waste, including models of textile use, is still very idealized. The technology and investment to effect change is not yet available to achieve anything significant at scale. 
while a huge proportion of the world economy is constituted in fashion industries. They're estimated to employ at least 60 million people in a variety of roles, which are largely servicing fast fashion. Now, what is harder to identify alongside the economic and environmental impact is the meaning and value of fast fashion to the many consumers. Its meaning is not trivial and it can't be adjusted or abolished or reasoned out of existence lightly. Recycling is a valuable contribution to reducing mountains of waste from the consumption of fashion, but it must be low in energy use to justify that strategy. And it's way too little to have impact all on its own. So the real activity must be radical. It must happen soon and be game changing in terms of public attitudes to consumption. And this is where you and we all come in. Because de design for sustainability ability rightly concentrates on the planetary benefits of slow with an emphasis on longevity of the product. And good practices are really brilliant and getting more attention all the time. But they're ignored by the increasing number of consumers of cheap, fast fashion for many, many reasons. Consumption is increasing in wealthy countries, I mean of cheap fashion, and in poor countries too, as they become wealthier. So to have any effect on the problem, several things need to happen now. A range of actions worldwide, some financial, penalizing retail companies if they benefit from unsustainable practices in the supply chain, some legal, curbing manufacturers' ability to profit from exploitation, and some behavioral, finding ways to nudge a change towards longevity and slower consumption. So here's where design and technology are both in the business of imagining and creating irresistible alternatives to the many unsustainable current offers. When services replace ownership, designers can add it to their practice. High quality goods can always be designed for maximum lifespan. This has failed to recognize the potential to provide solutions to buying cheap, especially for groups with limited means. So if a circular flow of this kind of stuff, goods made from cheap materials, is to be profitable, it must profit from the speed at which the material travels, a transformation of the material, and all carried out with sustainable processes. So design for disassembly at the outset, local production to reduce transportation, an aspiration of repair, all these things count into the new plan. And so do cool tools. Tools to analyze complex problems, tools for sustainability. On the left, I'm showing you Brian Eno and Peter Schmidt's oblique strategy cards produced a long time ago. Oh, I see it's 1975 on eight. the slide. Oh, Five and eight, yeah. Eight. Um, and the cards each have an observation or a question to encourage lateral thinking. They were made originally for musicians in rehearsal spaces who found when they had found they had writer's block. And this was a very interesting way to speak to the right brain when the left brain says it has nothing to give. And it's quite an interesting way. You could make them yourself. You could buy them, I think, on Amazon, great expense. But essentially, it's just the idea of prompts to move you forward when you're not sure how to analyze a problem. And on the right are the 10 strategy cards developed here at Chelsea in the textile research group now the Center for Circular Design, of course. When the group of practitioners and teachers needed to be informed on how to address intractable problems, such as sustainability and waste of materials and the lasting implications of design choices, our research focus gradually moved through sustainability, evolving our approach to the definition and communication of good design. So it became clear to us the decisions of at all stages of the life cycle of products and materials have a significant role in approaching sustainability. And the old linear model, design, production, use and disposal, must be developed into a circular model with waste streams as raw materials as well as virgin. Now, I'm sure you're all very familiar with this argument. 
but also the speeds with which products are moving from design to waste is speeding up as profits are in the material production and the product manufacture and in retail distribution parts of the circle. We need to map the field and develop tools to help us define the challenges and formulate approaches across the disciplines. So we and the rest of the world are still only just getting started. The 10 cards you see here developed to identify the tactics and map the field to suggest opportunities for change can also identify and question the way to challenge the intractable problems of unsustainable systems. So cards one to five relate to materials and production systems and car cards five to 10 are concerned with human behavior, how we use textile products and their meaning. An important combination of material and systems development with be behavior change. So selecting from the 10 strategies is one way to start thinking about how your practice might move forward. Prototypes can be developed which explore an interconnected view of design and can feed into a kind of question coding. Now, designing textiles which contribute to sustainability comes under the category of wicked problems, not because they're difficult, but because they're so imprecise and conflicted. So I've set out here a kind of way to think about the area for consideration rather than a directive or, or a prescription for how to do this. And I'd like you to consider it. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of how this might be applied so that this isn't all generalities and I'm not um, disregarding the actual on the ground decisions that have to be made. This list was developed from IDENC's question fanning techniques and problem solving analysis. So you see that the first, the first point at the top is identifying the problem. Now we've established that that is huge and complex. So then we need to rephrase the problem as a question, examine the question, derive new questions from the barriers, select from the new questions and frame the aims of your practice. So let's just give that a try and see if you can follow an idea that I had to explain it. So if you take um, the idea of a big problem as cheap fast fashion is causing pollution, exploitation and waste in production and in use and disposal, that becomes the question is how can design be used to reduce the pollution in production and the disposal of fashion textiles while preserving financial viability. And I've sketched out here a list of a not exhaustive list, but quite a long list of possible barriers as to why that's not happening. And I've handed this to Rebecca Early, who's happened to be sitting next to me here, isn't surprised because she remembers seeing this long ago. <laughs> um, and Becky selected from the list, which she felt were the barriers that she could perhaps address in her practice. And the barriers that she selected were material waste is not sufficiently desirable to avoid landfill. So her question became how can material waste, how can she sufficiently make sufficiently desirable the waste and valuable to avoid landfill? So Becky's practice, heat transfer processes, was applied to unreconstructed and most unloved charity shop polyester shirts. And in that way, she added years to a garment's life and transformed them into desirable collector's pieces. So on the left, you see the kind of transformation of the question into the question Becky's answering, and then her way of going about that. So this is one example of how that question coding might be used to take another the same list of problems, but this time to design a Kate Goldsworthy. I move that on. And Kate selects the barriers. Two of them, technologies and material waste. That fits her practice, 
because the two questions then become what technologies could transform the material and how can the value be added to avoid landfill? And the transformation into a brief enabled Kate to deconstruct a charity shop garment into pattern pieces for design intervention. And using the very sophisticated technologies that she's been developing and was in her PhD, she produced a monomaterial fashion garment with surface interest, with texture, with recyclable polyester, and could market it solely on aesthetic quality and price. Now, this is a huge increase in the value of the charity shop garment. And it's a way in which practice can take on the important job of moving forward through a list of quite prescribed moves, how it can be entirely related to your own personal interests and practice. The third example is here is of myself. Um, same list. And I selected three things because my interest is in, for those who know me already, uh, it's, it's quite um, well known that it's in a short life product and a long life material. And I'm excited to think that people might be ready to, be, to behave differently if they're offered a different solution to simply keeping things for a long time. What I'm interested in doing is finding the way that we can really redesign fast fashion and not make it simply a cheap copy of long lived fashion. So the design brief that I worked on was to use paper and it's something that I've been long thinking as a way to um, reconfigure or reframe, if you like, the idea of fast fashion altogether. And it comes into a kind of settled thinking that we in the circular design group at Chelsea have started to work on for quite a long time. And that's to say, if we push the idea of the lifespan to the extremes, an extremely fast circle and an extremely slow circle of movement, we then get the idea of things that you keep for a long time and things that you can move on quickly that then have their own culture of recycling to be sustainable. And this, this actually has continued through our practice in research. So it's extreme, I know, and sometimes it's extreme for a reason. But our particular interest in material circularity has led to us thinking a lot about the speed of flows and the different kinds of products that leads to. So when we were invited to take part in the Swedish Research Foundation um, funded project Mistra Future Fashion um, in 2011, we were able to collaborate with other disciplines to use the fashion industry as a case study for profitable environmental innovation. Our research group at Chelsea was selected to participate. Um, Becky already, thanks to Becky, already had a, a contact through H&M um, into Sweden, and we were selected to be the design group in a large spread of collaborators, mostly Swedish, uh, Copenhagen Design Business School and us. There were 15 research partners and 50 industry partners. So you see there uh, a statement about what the, the, the project was. And European manufacturers in the supply chain were involved in this. So we were actually working, th albeit theoretically, with the real business of fashion, with real people and their problems and their opportunities. And that gave us over nine years, I think it was, I'm looking at Becky now. Um, yes, I think it was nine years um, to work on this. So here's a snapshot of the some of the prototypes that we modeled in this um, in this project. And as you see that that arrow um, sits above the the images below of a short life of multiple loops and a long life of an extended loop. Um, 
And halfway through this long project, very sensibly, it was switched from everyone working in their own technical and specific area to group themes. And we ended up leading the um, design theme because that was one of the four themes. They decided design, supply, user and recycling. Now, the main driver of the design theme research was to find more collaborative collaborative ways for design to work with other disciplines and it involved many academics from all the other um, contributing partners. Would product longevity and the slowing down of fashion systems hold up as the only sustainable option or could we defend a complementary approach moving at a faster pace than most environmentalists might approve of but with effective recovery of the materials? To fully understand the range across this spectrum, we focused on the extremes. So here's the, the extreme example uh, that Becky led, which is the service shirt. And in a way, to talk about these, these examples is a talk in itself, and it has been on many occasions. But um, I'll just suffice it to say for this service shirt to last 50 years, it has to change hands many times and it has to go through iterations of design um, and to understand more about the potential for, for extending the use with traditional consumers the researchers spent time with a family and gained insights in how a shirt might be used how different objects might be used in the family and friendship circle so if we move on to the next image you'll see then that from the ultra fast on the left to the super slow on the right that I'm talking about now, the thinking was tested in the development of the materials and selection of the materials. So both approaches included processes to preserve the effect from each extreme concept, either the garments to wear a few times, no launder, or and go through paper recycling, industrial composting, or a 50 year projection through many users and modifications Finally, to chemical recycling. Now, I have a big list of, of people who worked with us on this. And of course, they were many of them were in Sweden, but they were all, I would say, with their scientific and specialist knowledge, still very creative in the way that they approached the whole concept. And more so once we had the discussions from our particular position. So the the kind of feedback we got from them was hugely instructive to us because up till now it's all very well sitting and dreaming up theoretical studies when you actually make the thing you've then got something to test and it was the testing of this that was both scary and rewarding i meanwhile while becky was designing this 50-year shirt had a radical material focused brief <laughs> I'd given myself to revolutionize the idea of fast fashion. So I needed a good narrative. And the narrative was this is a great opportunity to mimic the poetic qualities of cycles in nature, short ones, and provide the nutrients for ecology of fashion. And I used the Japanese tradition of mono no aware, short cycles in nature, such as cherry blossom. That certainly won a few hearts and minds. So innovation starts with mimicking the familiar. And it also starts with hacking existing systems across a range of interest industries. And here you see a list connected to the paper that I developed. And it, it actually starts with the familiar and looks at what exists now, what could be put to use in this novel concept all i'm doing actually is using what exists in a new way and that is so often what an innovation is it's not always about inventing a whole new technology so there are several ways in which you can advance material recovery you can recover virgin materials from existing waste streams and design for recovery, starting from the end and working backwards. You can use inbuilt design features that enable more efficient recovery and support the material recovery. And you can reduce 
pr production impacts. Innovative production systems can reduce overall impacts of garments. So all this thinking needs to go into what seems immediately like just dreaming a bit in your studio. And here you see a reference to the amazing contribution Pen Penny Walsh made in AO Designs in Natural Dyes on the Papers. And the brief I set myself, as I'm explaining, is to develop a material based on a renewable natural source, a whole series of features. It had to be wearable, it had to have no laundry, it had to have no chemicals, it had to be industrially composted. It's a huge list. And it's similar to the list that you would need to make on any design project that you were thinking about at the outset. So I did collaborated closely with Kate Goldsworthy through the project. Kate was hugely influential in the technological treatments. And we worked closely with the material scientists at RISE in Sweden uh, to develop the new bio-based non-wovens. Essentially, paper is a non-woven. It's just made on a paper machine. That's something we were surprised to discover was a definition of paper. Um, it, it's not about what goes into it. It's about what you make it on. And that was one of many discoveries we made in this, in this um, moving forward. So we included samples with low PLA fiber to um, try to soften the kind of um, material that we would end up with, but, but give it strength. And we would hand crimp, crimp and give the samples a stretch and a muffled sound. We used a lot of different thinking on the way the fabric or the paper fabric might behave. And this demonstrated that it's the interplay of choices made at the outset, such as the mixture of the fibers that are inputted and the combination of the finish and what you do in terms of the finish as a textile designer is hugely influential in what happens in production to the interpretation of your design. So I'm just showing you briefly the way the paper was dyed. It was strong, but too stiff to be wearable, or it was soft, but too weak to be worn. And we battled with this all the way through. And to make it fast, to become sustainable and complementary, industry must get a profit from this. So it had to be done very, very cheaply and in great volume to add value. The important thing, of course, to us was that it should be reusable as a pulp or as a compostable element in at the end of its life. So beauty came from the attention to detail in production, especially through the automated systems, just as much as if it were a handcrafted item. The user perception is not a small issue. I'm, I'm skating over that. But Essentially, if you're going to propose to people that they wear paper, their first response is not not on your life. <laughs> and they're more scared about the social embarrassment that they might incur if the paper fell away when they were out in some crowd or that it hadn't been sufficiently tested to behave like clothes that they used to. All that is huge. But you see from this that when people didn't know it was paper, as you look along the bottom of the bars, you see they rated it quite high in whether they would wear it or not. And that's going back to your left and right, right brain thinking. That's quite significant and not a small part of a designer's role in how you present things, what they're called, what they look like, what they feel like, what people think about them. So consumer responses to what you make are really important to whether you'll be able to go on making them. And a new set of design prototypes to be explored um, might come out of that very issue, like would the paper maybe be a lining for more, for more regular fabric or would it be an overlay to change the look of it? There are whole new ways that we can develop that problem into a new design development. So work from the project, some of the work from the project is currently touring um, as part of the V&A exhibition Fashion from Nature which is about to return from its exhibition in China now. I think uh, that's the final part of stage of it, um, which apart from our wearable paper, of course, includes other current material research developments. So take a look at that online if, if you feel interested. And one of the final outcomes I want to point out from that project 
the BISTRA project was working with industry. We were embedded researchers, I think it was, <laughs> termed in Philippa K in Sweden, the fashion brand. And we, as researchers in residence, we worked on a, a pilot project with Philippa K and we exposed our thinking and development to the Philippa K team and supported their front runners garments. Uh, the project surpassed expectations from our side, I think, and I hope from theirs. It certainly resulted in fast and slow concepts coming from Philippa K with enthusiasm. Um, yeah. We couldn't thank them enough for their enthusiastic response and real world take up of these ideas. And the image I'm showing you now is Philippa K's eternal trench coat which was acquired by the v &A Museum as part of their permanent fashion gallery showcase. Now, of course, many other projects have contributed to the work of the Research Centre before and since the one I've been describing. And many have included similar collaborations. I, can th I think I can say we've all at various times seen the benefits of bringing a textile designer's sensibilities to a multidisciplinary team. And I believe that assumptions are no longer that the textile designer in the group is the one who's waiting to be given an opportunity to decorate. To design is to create and creating is the beginning. So now back to the present. Design theory offers many explanations to the designer what about what design is. And beware, academic design language helps to avoid reality within its conventions. But you, the practicing designers, are really in the business of knowing through doing what separates the ideals and the cliches from the daily reality and the struggle. You have the option of experiential learning and critical reflection, which will continue throughout your practice. I have a quote here from Aristotle, if I dare to make it. It says, for the things we have to learn before we can do them, we learn them by doing them. Now, that was in 350 BCE. You can make sure that sustainability is not just a marketing term to assist poor design. You will learn how to apply it by doing it. You know that selecting natural materials is not the way to improve products only. What improves them is truly understanding how they perform. The best material or process is the one you select for its appropriateness in any given context. And remember, innovation is nothing without a sustainable improvement. The maker's voice is not the loudest one in academic discourse. It's authentic and valuable and needs to be included in the publications of theoretical ideas. So strengthen your convictions and keep them by you whenever you're facing practical compromises. Think what is the wrong I want to write. As the sustainability of you, the individual designer, is the priority. Thank you.